Um, thank you very much indeed. Well, Alice has been talking about the Pleistocene. What is the name of the era that comes after the Pleistocene? Some have called it the Anthropocene. Because as you can tell, humans, even at the end of the Pleistocene, were starting to have an enormous impact on the planet. And it's really entirely apposite that I should be giving this talk in Birmingham. Because, of course, it was here, something over 200 years ago, that the Industrial Revolution started. And it was that Industrial Revolution that enabled the most enormous change, a good change, in the lifestyle of the majority of human beings, which has resulted in the ability of humans to uh, reproduce in ever large numbers, to survive for much longer. But of course it's had the consequence that the impact, our footprint on the planet, is greater than it ever was. Am I pressing the button? No, not. Oh, no. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and the wrong sabotage. <laughs> sabotage. That's no better. <laughs> ah. Ah. ah, bingo. Okay. Um, so, my job is to advise the government on all aspects of science engineering, technology, and social science with regard to all aspects of government policy. So why am I here talking about this topic tonight? If you think about the things that government really cares about, good governments broadly care about two things. They care about the health, the well-being, the resilience, and the security of the populations for which they're responsible, and they care about the economy. And of course, those two things are interlinked. Now, if you think about what it is that contributes to our health, our well-being, our resilience and our security, it is actually our infrastructure. That infrastructure that was modified forever by the fruits of the Industrial Revolution. And you can divide the infrastructure into two sorts. You can divide it into the built, the engineered infrastructure, buildings, transport, energy, movement of water, movement of waste, and then you can think about it in terms of the natural infrastructure, our weather, our climate, our human health, our animal health, our plant health. And those are so important that, and science, engineering and technology, and in social science, and I'll come back to that later, are absolutely crucial to each of those areas. And so for any government chief scientific advisor, it's inevitable that energy will be an important topic. And of course, climate and energy come together in this particular topic because it is the sources of energy that we use that re result in the release of enormous amounts of carbon and other greenhouse carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere that are changing our planet. So our built engineered infrastructure and our natural infrastructure come together around the topic of climate change. And so it's inevitable that that is an important topic. And the reason I'm here is because the policy decisions that need to be made, and my job is to provide advice to the government on the science, it's the politicians that we collectively elect that make the policy decisions. That policy debate is one for all of us. But we can only have the most effective policy debate if we have the most effective scientific analysis and input. <coughs> and so my talk over the next few minutes is really divided into three areas. Um, and they're all quite difficult. So the first is the science of climate change. And Alice has already started to illustrate some of the complexity as she described the Milankovitch cycles and all the different factors that influence those. So there's the science. There's then a the challenge of communications, because conveying this science in a useful way is quite a tough challenge in itself. And in fact, the figure in the middle uh, is an example of exactly how not to communicate a science um, to anyone, even a specialised audience. Um, and then the hardest challenge of all, in many ways, is the challenge at the bottom right of this slide, which is the policy challenge. And that is really the challenge that faces policymakers and is one that I think we should be all debating. 
So one of the very big challenges in talking about, and indeed in studying climate, is the distinction between weather and climate. And of course, weather is part of our climate. Uh, we're very influenced by our weather. We get an awful lot of weather in the United Kingdom. Uh, we've just had the wettest three months on record, with the consequences of extraordinary flooding, particularly in the southwest and around the Thames. Um, so weather is foremost in our mind at the moment. And one of the questions inevitably that's asked is, is the current episode of weather, very bad weather, with the recurrent storms, um, the flooding, is that caused by climate change? And I'll come back to that. Um, but the climate is really the average of weather over prolonged periods of time. And there's no precise definition, but you can look at climate changes over periods, or climate over periods of 10, 20, 30, 50, 100 years. And so our climate is our weather average over very prolonged periods of time. And it's that that anthropogenic effects are, 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 is modifying. And so, again, Alice has already talked about some of the natural influences on our climate, and of course these op operate on very different timescales. And the timescale, of course, that we're all most familiar with is the timescale of the seasons. The distinction between spring, summer, autumn and winter. And so there are the annual seasonal cycles of our climate, and we have different weather during each of those cycles. And then there are the multi-annual cycles, the uh, winds, the El Nino, which affects the currents in the Pacific Ocean, and La Nina, and they recur every few years. Then there are the multi-decadal cycles, uh, things like the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, um, and that causes changes in the climate because the oceans are an enormous heat sink, they're enormous, um, uh, and therefore they have a big effect on atmospheric conditions. And then there are the multi-century multi cycles, um, and Alice has talked about some of those, so for example the Milankovitch cycles, which as she said are related to the Earth's orbital parameters around the Sun, and they're seen in those 100,000 year ice age cycles that we've just heard about. Now, Key to understanding the effect of human greenhouse gas emissions on climate is an understanding of the greenhouse effect. And this is a piece of very established physics. It was established in the middle of the 19th century. And we, in fact, depend on the greenhouse effect for our ability to survive on Earth and the conditions we have at the moment. And so, again, as we've already heard, the sun provides heat and energy, it irradiates um, the planet with short wave light, um, and that provides input of energy from the sun. Um, and then, um, in turn, the Earth that warms emits energy of uh, uh, electromagnetic energy of longer wavelength, infrared, um, and some of that escapes straight out of the atmosphere, and you can see that on the, the figure on the right. Um, but much of it is retained within the atmosphere and it's retained by natural greenhouse gases, water is a greenhouse gas, um, and carbon dioxide, methane, the products of burning uh, fossil fuels, which I'll come on to in a minute, will increase the retention of those greenhouse gases, and, 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 and uh, sorry, of that, of that infrared radiation, and that will result in warming of the planet. So that's the basic physics of the greenhouse gas effect. Um, and in fact, that's very complicated because there are then many different drivers, many different things that affect both the incoming solar irradiation, so for example, clouds that block it, um, aerosols that may reduce the inflow of solar radiation, and all sorts of different factors that affect the outflow as well. And this is a, a figure from the Intergovernmental Panel, Panel on Climate Change a recent report. Now, Alice was talking about two and a half million years ago, or 2.6 million years ago, um, but we often forget that in fact we are inheriting the atmosphere from life that lived a thousand times <coughs> earlier than that, so two and a half billion years ago. And the atmosphere that we take for granted, that we breathe now, that is suited to the metabolism of the species that live on Earth at the moment, was actually generated by those ancestral organisms from which we are all descended. And so photosynthesis began about two and a half billion years ago, 
fixing carbon dioxide from the early atmosphere and resulting in the release of oxygen back into the atmosphere. So the fact that our atmosphere now comprises about 20% of oxygen is the consequence of the inheritance of that from the photosynthesis of all those billions and billions and billions and trillions of organisms over very many billions of years. Um, and it was cyanobacteria, a form of a microorganism that were the first to evolve the capability. And then the carboniferous forests, the origins of our coal, um, evolved about 300 million years ago and fixed enormous amounts of carbon dioxide. So the paradox is that that fossil energy that we have inherited, that fueled the Industrial Revolution, that drove the steam engines that you see arrayed outside this room, um, that is something that we inherited from the ancestral organisms from which we're all ultimately descended. And so you see on this slide the coal, the oil and the gas, which is all the product of basically the, the metabolism, the photosynthesis of fossilised organisms from billions and millions of years ago that is deposited in coal and gas. And Alice showed how we started to modify our environment, and humans have modified the environment in innumerable ways. Um, the Anthropocene really is an apposite description of the age in which we live at the moment. So the, we deforested the world. Um, the evidence from the Doomsday Book, from soil records, from climate modelling shows that um, from 1000 BC to 1500 AD, England and Wales, for example, were deforested from about 90% of cover to 17% of tree cover. And with industrialization, the pace of the modification of the planet speeded up. And we must be conscious of the legacy that we are leaving behind us. So we've moved from development of complex stone tools about 100,000 years ago uh, the change in agriculture, the domestication of fruits, of animals, uh, the arrival of organised farming, deforestation, and then in brown that enormous event, the practical steam engine and all of the consequences that have come from that. And of course what has come with that is an exponential growth of the population of humans on the planet. <coughs> such that we're about 7 billion people on the planet. Um, and you can see the very short uh, time scale in which that's happened. And what's happening, of course, is that our atmosphere is catching up. Um, and here you see um, carbon dioxide levels measured, as we heard before, from ice cores. And you can see a cycle of uh, carbon dioxide concentrations measured on ice cores over about 800,000 years. Um, and then right at the very right of the graph, you suddenly see this jump in carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere from a peak over the last 800,000 years of about 280 parts per million to where we are now, which is about 400 parts per million in the atmosphere. And that change has happened over an extraordinarily short period. And what you see right on the very right is different scenarios for what might happen in the future. And so if we carry on as we are burning fossil fuels at the present, then it's likely by the turn of the next century that our carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere may be as high as 900 parts per million. Uh, and I'll come back to the little insect graph which shows the rate of production of and release of carbon into the atmosphere and the different sources of it. Now, I come, as you heard, from the world of medicine, and it's common now to talk about evidence-based medicine. And medicine proceeds by clinical trials, by lots of experiments, um, but one of the ways in which we know, and one of the ways in which evidence-based medicine has advanced, is that you can't necessarily rely on any single scientific paper. The process of science is reducing uncertainty through observations, through experiments. And it's only when you put it all together and arrive at a consensus that you can have the maximum confidence in a set of scientific experiments. 
And medicine has understood that for a long time, and we have a process which is known as meta-analysis, that's looking at a whole series of papers and putting together the evidence in the best consensus fashion and saying all the evidence at the moment shows that the treatment of disease X with drug Y, that yields the, the following potential benefits and potential side effects. And meta-analysis has now come to the world of climate science. And in the middle of last year, we had the report of the Intergovernmental Planet Panel on Climate Change, their fifth report. Um, and that's an extraordinary piece of work. Uh, it's led by over 250 principal scientists from 39 countries around the world. And they've read between them thousands of papers, each of which typically has several, or in some cases, many scientific contributors, each of which has been published in the scientific literature, each of which has been peer reviewed. And so the IPCC is an example of a meta-analysis of all of the research around climate and climate change. Um, and so it's an extremely robust piece of work. And because it's a consensus document, if anything, it tends to be slightly uh, conservative, rejecting the most extreme interpretations of the data. Um, and because of that, it actually makes it easier for scientists to present to government because so much work has gone into this rigorous process of so-called meta-analysis. And the evidence is that warming of the planet of the climate is unequivocal. And what you can see in this graph is going back to 1850, you can see a whole series of different temperature measurements at the surface of the planet. Um, and you can see that uh, between 1950 and 2000 in particular, there's been this trend to upward temperatures. And from 1900 to the present, the average temperature at the surface of the planet has warmed by about 0.8 degrees centigrade. Now, one of the problems with the communication of climate change is a problem of what I would call small numbers and large numbers. Because 0.8 degrees centigrade doesn't seem like very much. Uh, the difference between the temperature in this room and the temperature just in the corridor outside is a jolly sight more than 0.8 degrees centigrade. Um, so you might say, why does that tiny amount matter? Well, it matters because actually that's not an even temperature change across the planet. And what we're actually seeing is climate disruption, which I think is a better term than climate warming. Um, and what you can also see on the, the bottom is that when you start averaging, the, so you can see that the line on the top is quite jagged, it goes up and down, because from year to year, our weather is chaotic, and so there is a lot of variation. But when you start averaging it over 10-year periods, then you can start seeing that, for example, each of the last three decades has been warmer than the one before, and indeed likely to be warmer than any periods in the last 800 years. And so you can see the effects of averaging out the variations in weather um, and measuring it at climate. Now, that is not the only set of measurements. If that was the only set of measurements, then there would be lots of uncertainty. But you, there are certain predictions you would make in a planet that is warming. Um, and that is, of course, that firstly, you would measure increase in temperature at various different locations. So you would measure a, a, an increase in the temperature at the surface of the sea. Uh, you would measure it in different parts of the atmosphere. Um, if the Earth is warming, you would expect there to be less ice. And so you would expect glacier volumes to go down. Um, you would expect the amount of snow cover to drop. And because you're getting melting of ice, and also because as temperature warms, you get expansion of water, so you get expansion of the seas, you would expect to see sea levels go up. So there are a whole string of predictions <laughs> that are fairly basic physics that follow from a planet that's warming. And if you look at the measurements of all of these things, then you see that the trends are in the same direction. Um, and so this is a measurement of ocean heat content um, going back to about 1950. And each of those lines is a different measurement set, so it's an independent set of measurements. And you can see the ocean heat content going up. Uh, you can see a very consistent uh, increase in the levels of sea level. So you see level rising, and it's going up by about 3 millimetres per year. Uh, it's gone up about 20 centimetres since 1900. And so, again, and a whole string of different measurements. Um, and you can see that there are changes in 
um, ice. So you can see that the Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets are both losing mass. Um, the amount of ice in the um, uh, polar regions is reducing and the minimum each summer is getting gradually smaller. There's been a lot of debate about whether there's been a pause in global warming. Um, and the reality is that we're looking at incredibly complicated systems where there are these decadal cycles, there are changes in um, the wind patterns over the oceans, and the oceans are enormous heat sinks. And so these are the sorts of changes that you expect to see in chaotic systems. And we shouldn't read anything too much into the apparent pause in warming that's occurred over the last few years. And indeed, sea level continues to rise, the ocean heat content continues to increase. And so I don't think there's really any evidence that there's any significant pause in global warming. And the question is, what will happen in the next few years? Um, and the Met Office, which run extremely sophisticated models, and one of the things that I think we will all have recognized over the past few months is how accurate the weather forecasts have been. Uh, over the short term period, they use the same models to predict weather to predict changes in climate over a prolonged period. And when you run those models, and this is a graph that was just released a couple of weeks ago, um, and the observations of the black line um, are, are observations until the present, and then the series of blue squiggles on the let's see if I can get the to work. Sorry. The, the, yeah, the, the blue squiggles show different runs of the Met Office model. And you can see that we don't know exactly what's going to happen over the next five years. But there's a whole series of different outcomes within the green bars, which is the sort of confidence limits, the 95% variability on what might happen. And it may well be that the climate will continue to warm. And you can see that many of the models show that it will go up. Uh, but it may still remain constant for another four or five years as well. So there is a great deal of uncertainty, but the trend is absolutely <coughs> clear. And the point I've already made is that when we look at warming, it's not uniform across the globe. And so these are changes between um, 1900 and 2012, and you can see that some parts of the world, the darkest parts on this figure, have warmed by uh, in, in, case, in many cases about two degrees. There's one small area in the North Atlantic where there has been, in fact, some degree of cooling. But you can see the obvious trend around the world and the variation that we're seeing and the fact that this is climate disruption rather than simply average warming of 0.9 degrees centigrade. So what we're seeing is climate disruption and the prediction of what goes with that is that in those parts of the world that are hot, it will be hotter, there will be more hot days, there will be fewer cold days overall. Um, in parts of the world that are rainy already, there will be more periods of rain and extreme rainfall, and droughts will tend to be worse. So these are the predictions that go with climate disruption. And coming to the point as to whether we can say that the events, the storms of the last few months, have been caused directly by climate change. It's really impossible to attribute any single episode of severe weather to climate change. But what one can say is that the trend over time will be that there will be more periods of extreme weather. And so this, if nothing else, is a foretaste of things to come. And of course, as sea levels continue to rise, so the impact of storms, of coastal surges, becomes greater. And so when you have a severe storm, like Storm Sandy, that affected the east coast of the United States last year, then the risks of coastal inundation will be very much greater as sea levels rise. And looking into the future, and there's always uncertainty looking into the future, then you can see the potential, if we carry on, and the red figures, the red graph here, is business as usual if we simply carry on emitting carbon as we are at present. Then we see that by uh, 2100 uh, there may be a rise since the present of about 0.6 to 0.8 uh, of a metre in sea levels around the world. And that has obvious consequences for human beings that like to live 
in coastal regions. Historically, we've always liked living next to rivers, next to lakes, next to oceans. And the implications of climate change are really all pervasive. Um, so in some parts of the world, they will be wetter. Um, and in dry areas, there's likely to be more drought, more dry regions, with all of the consequences that go with that. Um, this matters for food. And whilst there may be, for a while, increases in crops in parts of the world that are cool and will benefit from being warmer for a while, in the long term, the impact on the plants on which we depend for our food and for which many other species and ecosystems depend is going to be damaged. And many of the diseases that affect humans depend on animal vectors of various sorts, so insect-borne diseases like malaria, and dengue, and as temperature change, so the distribution of those species that carry the diseases to which we're prone will change as well, and so disease patterns are likely to change. And again, there'll be more heat waves um, and, and less in the way of cold, and it has been pointed out by some people that there are more deaths in the UK from cold than there are from heat, and that is undoubtedly true. Uh, but if you look at the world as a whole, and the consequences for the warmer parts of the world, then the net effect on human health for the planet as a whole is very unlikely to be a beneficial one. And as I've already said, we'll see more damaging extreme events. And what happens to that carbon dioxide? Well, some of it goes up, but some of it is also absorbed from the atmosphere into the oceans. And the consequences, and you saw the foraminifera uh, that Alice showed before, is that the pH of oceans will drop, and that will have impacts for the marine life. Um, it will cause problems for those organisms that depend on calcified shells. And here is a graph that shows a steady decline in pH as the oceans and the seas take up carbon dioxide. So the implications aren't only for temperature, they're also for the state of the oceans which again has the potential to cause great damage to the life within it. Um, and many of those organisms are at the bottom of huge and important food chains that ultimately lead and enable the survival of some of the largest creatures on the planet now, are whales. So that's the science. And the science is hard. Communicating it is hard because of the challenge of distinguishing between um, weather and between climate change the problem of small numbers, and also the problem of large numbers. And I'll come on to the 10 gigatons of carbon that we emit into the atmosphere each, atmosphere each year. So the question now, and this really is a question for all of us, is what are the policy responses? And I sometimes think that the, some of the scepticism around climate change is related to the fact that people don't really want to contemplate the difficult policy choices. And one way of not facing a policy choice is to deny that it's necessary to make it. Um, and I'm not sure that that's the most sensible approach. The science here is very rigorous. Uh, we don't know exactly what's going to happen in 50 or 75 or 100 years. But we do know very clearly the direction of travel. And I'll come back to the challenges which are going to be felt by our grandchildren, by their grandchildren, and by their grandchildren's grandchildren. And so we have three policy responses. We can mitigate, we can reduce our carbon emissions, our use of fossil fuel. Uh, we can adapt to a changing world, and the Thames Barrier is an example of such an adaptation. Or we can suffer the consequences. And the reality is that we're likely to have to do all three. And we have some clear policy choices as well. We could decide we're simply going to do nothing. That we're going to carry on burning fossil fuel as though there were no tomorrow, and indeed there may be no tomorrow for humans as a result, but that is a legitimate policy choice, not one I happen to share. Uh, we can decide we do absolutely everything to stop it, or we can decide to do something in between. And these are extremely difficult policy decisions, but they're ones that I think that we all need to debate and engage in the discussion about. And this is the large number problem. This is the graph that was inset before. And that is that we are now emitting approximately 10 gigatons of carbon into our atmosphere every year. 
Now, what's 10 gigatons? It's not a number that means anything very readily. Well, 10 gigatons is 10 billion tons. And billions, I think, one begins to get one's head around. That's 10,000 million tons of carbon dioxide every year. 10,000 million tons is an enormous amount. Um, and is it possible to visualize that? Well, here's an example of, I think, a good uh, visualization from Cayenne Visuals. Um, and this is a New York Vista. Um, and what you can see is uh, what the equivalent of a metric ton sphere of carbon dioxide looks like. And you can see them in the city, um, in the streets, on the top left. And on the right, you see the Empire State Building just poking out of this enormous heap of a spheres of carbon dioxide, and that is New York's daily carbon dioxide emissions. So you have to multiply that by 365 to imagine what a year's emissions from New York look like. So these numbers are absolutely gigantic. And whilst Earth systems are enormous, they're certainly not infinite. And so I don't think it's difficult to see that emitting 10 gigatons of carbon every year, and it's on an increasing, it's increasing by 2 or 3% each year, that amount, is going to have an enormous impact. And once carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere, then it has quite complex clearance, but about half of it is likely to remain in the atmosphere for many decades, indeed many hundreds of years. And so a significant fraction of the carbon dioxide that is in the atmosphere now comes back to the events that happened in Birmingham in the late 18th century, around the start of the Industrial Revolution. And that carbon dioxide that is affecting the planet has been there, some of it, since the start of the Industrial Revolution. Now, looking to the future, um, there are several possibilities. And so this graph looks at, the on the x-axis along the bottom, um, the cumulative total of carbon dioxide emissions that humans have emitted since about 1850. And of course, that's when it, things really got going in terms of scale. Um, and on the black line, you can see um, what's happened to the present. And you can see that we've emitted about 500 gigatons, that's half a trillion tons of carbon dioxide since 1850. And that's been associated with a temperature change since 1900 of about 0.8 degrees centigrade on average. Now, if you project that forward and you project it to 2100, then the red line would be the extrapolation of that if we carry on emitting carbon essentially as we are at the moment. Um, and what you can see is that by then we would have emitted 2 trillion tonnes of carbon dioxide. Um, and it would be predicted that that would lead to a temperature change on the planet of about between three and a half and about six degrees centigrade. And that would be a huge disruption to our planetary climate. And then the yellow and the blue lines are different uh, cases. Um, and if we're to keep, basically, to a temperature change in the planet of two degrees or under, and that's going to be extremely hard to achieve, then we have to restrict our further carbon emissions to about another 500 um, gigatons of carbon dioxide. And you can do the sums fairly easily. Um, if we're emitting um, 10, increasing by 3% per year, you can see that we're going to get to that 500 gigatons very quickly indeed. Um, so those are the choices that face us. And the question is, can we reduce our consumption of fossil fuels to limit um, our carbon emissions? And turning to the UK now, um, and this is data, um, in fact, very recent data, there's a, an app that you can all get called Grid Carbon, um, and it tells you what the fuel sources of our electricity supply in the UK are um, in real time, effectively, about an hour separated from reality. And so as of today, for every kilowatt hour of electricity generated, we're emitting about half a kilo, 500 grams, of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And what's the source of that? Well, today we were burning, 38.8% of our electricity came from the burning of coal, 26% uh, from the burning of gas, 
14% uh, from nuclear, about 9% from wind, um, and that's a good windy day because that's about what we can achieve on a windy day. Um, a certain amount came from an interconnect with France, about just under 5%, and from Holland, a rather small amount, 2% from hydroelectric power, 1% um, from storage, um, and that's uh, one way of storing energy is to pump water uphill and then you can let it come down and generate hydroelectric power. Um, and so you can see that as of today, we're still burning an enormous amount of fossil fuel in order to uh, get our electricity supply on which we all depend. And how is all our energy from uh, fossil fuels um, used? Um, well, you can see that uh, fossil fuels, first of all, supplies about 87% of our total energy. Um, about just under 40% of it is used for us by moving around, by transport. Uh, we use about 30%, about a third just under in our homes, um, about just under 20% for industrial usage, and about 19% uh, for services, agriculture, and other sources. Uh, so you can see that in the UK, we are still fantastically dependent on the burning of fossil fuel. Um, and if you look at the transport, section and look at how that's used, then you can see about half of our fossil fuels and transport are used for driving around in cars, about 26% goods, um, aeroplanes about a quarter, and you can see that shipping and rail accounts for rather a small percentage, but of course we can move an awful lot of people uh, by shipping, sorry, by, by rail and an awful lot of goods by ship. Now, the UK government has actually amongst the strongest legislation of any country in the world to ensure that we do reduce our dependence on fossil fuels to mitigate and adapt. And so the Climate Change Act of 2008 actually requires that we cut our carbon emissions by at least 80% by 2050 relative to 1990 levels and by at least 34% by 2020. Uh, we have binding carbon budgets, which are set by a committee which is independent of government, the Committee on Climate Change. It advises government on the level of budgets and how to meet them, and it scrutinises what's delivered. Um, and again, every five years, there's a risk, on, a risk report for the UK on the effects of climate change, um, and Lord John Krebs is just kicking off another of those reviews at the moment. So the UK has been one of the leaders in the world in taking this problem very seriously indeed. But that brings us to the policy challenge, the challenge for politicians, for all of us. And that is the three lenses through which policymakers need to look at power supplies. So first and foremost, you need to look at it through the lens of security of supply because we know that the consequences of losing power for our advanced society are very serious indeed. If the lights go out, this building stops functioning completely, well, that may not matter, but actually the whole of Birmingham runs into difficulties very quickly because we have just-in-time supply chains. People go and they buy things in the supermarket and the supermarket shelves empty very quickly. All of our communications goes. So the effects of losing power supply are very severe indeed in um, advanced societies. So security of supply matters. The second issue is affordability. We have to be able to afford our energy, we have to be able to run our economy, we live in a competitive world. And then the third lens through which one needs to look at energy supplies, power supplies, is the one that we're discussing this evening, which is the effects on the sustainability of the planet. And so any policymaker who looks at power, energy, through one lens alone, is unlikely to come up with a sensible answer for dealing with the whole problem. Any sensible energy policy has got to look through all three of those lenses and make balanced decisions. And this is where the social science comes in, because politicians look through all these lenses, so do we, the general public. And this is work that was done by Nick Pigeon and his colleagues at Cardiff University, asking members of the general public about what they worry about in terms of energy. And nearly three quarters of people were concerned about climate change and think that the UK should reduce its use of fossil fuels. 83%, um, so just over four-fifths in this survey, were 
concerned that in the next 10 to 20 years electricity and gas will become unaffordable. Um, and 82% of the public had strong concerns about the UK becoming too dependent on energy from other countries. So I think all of us clearly recognise, and these are very large percentages, um, anyone being elected would be rather pleased to have voting figures that look like this. We all recognise that these are the three lenses through which you have to look at energy. And it really does pose the challenge for policy makers. How are we going to balance security of supply with cost and affordability with sustainability of the planet? Now, moving to the future, because we have to look forward, this is where science and technology is going to be extremely important and where our behaviour and how we respond is going to be extremely important. Because I've been talking about the supply of power, but of course the corollary of the supply of power is the demand and the use of power. And so there are, of course, important demand-side solutions whereby we can reduce our uh, power consumption. And so we can cycle, and that's good for us, as well as uh, being low carbon. Uh, we can decarbonize our energy supplies so we can move to electric vehicles, but that then begs the question as to where the electricity supply comes from, because if it comes from burning fossil fuels, then we don't have any gain. Uh, we can turn the temperature down on our thermostats, um, and we can use electricity in general much more efficiently. And so there are a whole range of things that each of us can and indeed must do if we have an impact. And then on the other side, there are the supply side solutions. Um, so we can uh, use alternative uh, energy sources, so we can use wind, we can use solar energy, we can use water. And this would all be terribly easy actually if the economics of these sources of power meant that they were as cheap or indeed cheaper than fossil fuels. Because if that was the case, we probably wouldn't be having much of a debate. It would be jolly easy. We'd just switch over. But each of these has its own technological challenges, and there's an enormous amount of research that we need to do to make them economically competitive with existing uh, burning of fossil fuels. And then, of course, in order to carry on burning fossil fuels, we can also potentially capture the carbon emissions that they produce, so we can capture and potentially store carbon dioxide which is emitted from the burning of fossil fuels. And that is technologically feasible, but it's, it, it's, it's, it's possible to do it, but it's still a big engineering challenge. And so we have to work on all of that. And I would just draw your attention to a tool that's available on the website of the Department of Energy and Climate Change, which is the 2050 calculator. Um, and this is an example of the calculator. It's available in several forms. This is a form for younger people. Um, and it enables you to do the experiment yourself to test what modifications would need to be made both to our consumption of power and our production <coughs> to meet the UK binding targets of an 80% reduction by 2050. And I commend it to you. And so I think one of the questions, looking at it from a science and technology point of view, is do we need another global Apollo or a Manhattan project? And I can tell you which of those I prefer. Um, but the challenge is very great, and this is an area where the scientific and technological community really do need to collaborate on a worldwide basis to take on the technological challenges of providing the power that we're addicted to, that we need for our advanced society, whilst at the same time not continuing to consume fossil fuel and generate emissions in the gigaton range. And this brings plenty of opportunities as well. So there are opportunities to improve the way we harvest wind power, though we should never forget the fact that wind doesn't blow all the time. Um, and that raises the issue of how we store energy as well and how we even out our usage for it. And one of the big problems is that we don't have effective ways of storing large amounts of energy other than pumping water uphill and then letting it come down later. Um, currently, carbon capture and storage, although possible, is unproven. And the UK is about to fund two big demonstration projects. And in fact, I visited a demonstration project in Canada fairly recently. Um, and of course, there's the potential of nuclear energy. Um, and the UK is moving ahead with nuclear energy. Um, and there are all sorts of technological opportunities there as well. Um, 
And we must recognize that many changes to our behavior will be good for our health as well. Um, and so burning less fossil fuels, releasing less um, of the other contaminants that go with it into the atmosphere is beneficial to health. Um, and one only needs to see the images of some of the cities in China, which are covered in smog, to see the benefits of the reduction in the consumption of fossil fuels. Um, but that's not going to be enough. We are going to need to adapt to the impacts of climate change as well. Um, and there's a lot of work to be done there as well. And as I've said, and I want to finish now because you've been very patient with your time, um, there are an awful lot of things that we can each individually do. Turning the thermostat down does make a difference. Uh, using more efficient appliances, more efficient fridges, does all cumulatively make a difference. A lot of little differences make cumulatively a big difference. Uh, insulating homes is one of the most effective things we can do and makes it easier to turn the thermostat down. Uh, so there's an awful lot we can do. But the challenge looking to the future is, as I've said, it's very much easier to predict the past than it is to the future. Of course there are uncertainties about the future. And I don't think there's any great advantage in dancing on the point of a pin as to whether the IPCC projections going forward are right to the nearest 0.2 of a degree, whether changes are going to be in 2050 or 2075 or 2100, or indeed after that. Uh, economists talk about discount rates when they look at the future. Um, and I think most of us, thinking about our grandchildren, would have a discount rate of zero for our grandchildren. We know our grandchildren, we want them to live in a world which they will find fit for purpose. The question I think for all of us is not so much what the discount rate for our grandchildren is, but what the discount rate we consider for their grandchildren. And I think that's the best way to think about it, because we are talking about changes which are caused by anthropogenic human emissions, burning of fossil fuel, over extremely short time periods. We're not talking about glacial, to use Alice's word, we're talking about things that are changing over decades and very small numbers of centuries. And so the reason I think it's important to talk about this is because there are some important policy decisions to be made and those really are the policy decisions for the people we elect and that's why I think it's important that we all think about them. Thank you for your attention.